So we just heard from some of our pitch slammers, our finalists, and I'm guessing some of them are hoping to scale their businesses someday to the level of our next two guests' companies. So what's the future for a scaled brewery? Here today to give us a view from opposite ends of the Brewers Association's top 50 are Stone Brewing CEO Dominic Engels and Carl Strauss Brewing co-founder and CEO Chris Kramer. Guys, please come on up to the stage. Good to see you. Yeah, just come on down. Good to see you. So I, I feel like we've got to get the elephant out of the room and just get this over with. There was a report today in one of our competitors, uh, Beer Marketers Insights, that Stone is for sale. Uh, you quickly shot that down, Dominique. Uh, why are they saying Stone's on the block? Oh, well, I think, um, you know, unfortunately, this industry is somewhat driven on clickbait. <laughs> and uh... not, not at Brewbound, okay? <laughs> Present company excluded. <laughs> Pause for applause. Um, but so, it, you know, there's always a bit of rumor mongering that goes on, and uh, I can dispel all those rumors. We're not for sale. You for sale? You for sale, Chris? Um, if someone wants to pay me billions of Call dollars, Chris. <laughs> I will definitely consider it. <laughs> there we go. We got, so we got that over with. There, there's been a ton of deal activity over the last few days. I'm curious to hear what you guys think of the Ballast Point deal, because are, are, are you guys viewing that as a re renewed, a revived competitor in your home markets? Um, I haven't really thought about it that way. You know, I think uh, they have a, a huge challenge um, for them. Um, you know, the sales have been declining the last couple of years. Uh, the new operators who are coming in are, you know, coming in from the Midwest. Um, they're new to the industry, and to write a ship that has been going down takes a lot of efforts. I, I know the guys who came in and took over Green Flash have had a, a challenge in their hands, and I think it will be a similar challenge uh, for Ballast point. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Chris. I think it's the same thing um, that Green Flash is a, maybe a year ahead of the challenges ahead for, for Ballast Point. And I just have to reflect on uh, a couple things. One is, I think it's fantastic for the employees and for the local community to have another beer brand that's back in the community in a, in a, uh, in a stronger way. Uh, however, like Chris said, you know, coming from Chicago, it sounds like I don't know kings and convicts from anybody, but um, certainly they've kind of stepped from the minor leagues into the major leagues <laughs> and uh, have no sales force. And it leaves a lot of questions as to how they're going to write the, the ship that's out there. Well, and jo Josh Knoll from the Chicago Tribune reported that they have some major backing behind them in the wine industry. Uh, I think it's... Uh, Cupcake, the person behind Cupcake. So, yeah, they, they've definitely got some pockets behind them. We're all learning. Kings, convicts, and cupcakes. <laughs> there good. we go. That, that's the new one, man. So, it, but the, the, competitive lands, the competitive landscape has changed a lot. I mean, we got to admit that over the last year, I guess, starting with, you know, Boston and Dogfish merging, and then you've got, you know, Kieran, uh, Lion Little World, planting a flag, a battle flag probably with New Belgium. Um, you've got CBA going to AB, which you know we all probably figured that was going to happen. Molson Coors is making some moves in non-alk. So how are you guys looking at this landscape? Because what I see is a, a lot of these partnerships starting to pop up too. You know, New Belgium's not going to be the last brewer that Lion acquires. So how do you guys look at that, when these roll-ups? Um, a couple different ways. Um, well, I, I think about uh, a brewer like New Belgium being sort of next level relative to Stone in terms of distribution. They have about twice the ACV of Stone. So on the one hand, I look at that as an opportunity for Stone. Stone's a national brand as well with a lot of headspace and from a distribution standpoint. Um, so uh, the fact that uh, Little World is building a, a, a platform that can be a threat to sort of our, our ability to get to the next level. So that's, that's how, I'm, how I'm thinking about um, 
what's happening there. And you know, it does seem like folks are picking dance partners a little bit more uh, at a quicker pace. And you know, I think for Stone, the way we think about it is, is that we want to use our unique model, which is similar to Chris's here too, where we are not only a brewer, but we're also a distributor. And we're also, also a creator of great craft beer experiences. And, um, and I think using those three things together is how we'll kind of compete in that world. You know, for us also, we only distribute our beers in one state, California. And so for us, you know, the, the world that you're talking about changing, I don't think it's going to change the California landscape as much as it might change the rest of the country. Um, you know, New Belgium is not a California-based brewery. And uh, Lion, you know, has already made an inroad here uh, with Little Creatures up in San Francisco mm -hmm. with their new uh, brew pub up uh, next to the ballpark. And, you know, I've, I've been to their operations down in Australia. We'll see how that all plays out, but it really, what they do doesn't affect how we do. What we do internally, how we operate our company, how we innovate, how we inspire our team members to be the best every day, that's going to make the difference in our future, not what the external factors are going to do. Do you guys, so you, I'm guessing you think that a brewer of scale can still go it alone these days? Absolutely. I think uh, there are always new opportunities in this industry. One of the great advantages of having been around for 30 years now is uh, we have seen continuous disruption. You know, we remember how things shook out at the end of the 90s, and we've been through the post 9-11 uh, period, and we've been through recessions. We've been through industry downturns. We've seen, you know, uh, IPAs not being accepted. We've seen IPAs becoming, you know, transcendent. Um, you know, you, you see seltzers come out of nowhere where you're always pivoting and moving towards whatever the new opportunities. Lately, um, in the distribution business, uh, we have been blessed in a way uh, here in California with all of the alignment the Constellation and Reyes have done that it has created new opportunities for us to grow the territory of our distribution uh, footprint so that we basically cover all of Southern California, which is one of the most valuable distribution territories in the world. And so, you know, I am blessed. I've got 40 million people in my my home state, the one state I operate in, an economy that's the fifth largest in the world. It's the size of the UK economy. And within four hour drive of my home brewery, I've got 24 million people. So as long as I win in my own backyard, I can win for a long time. Yeah. Dominique, do you see that the same way? How do you view it? That you've got national distribution? Yeah, so you can just hear by the answers that Chris has given and what I've given that we are in slightly different worlds. Uh, we certainly also want to take care of our own backyard, and we do that, like I said, through our restaurants and our distribution. I think it's important to note, being a distributor, we're the largest independent craft beer distributor in the United States, and uh, being a distributor allows us to credibly play in some of these beyond beer categories without necessarily stretching and, and mutating the stone brand. And uh, so I think that that's an interesting angle that strategically makes a ton of sense so that you're not feeling like as an independent beer brand trying to be all things to all people, you can participate in these things in different ways. And then for us, it's the added layer of we're a national brand. So we're in all the targets, a lot of Walmarts. Uh, so we have another consideration beyond what Chris is talking about where we do have to nurture that, that national presence. Yeah. You mentioned the wholesaler portion of your business is it, that would seem to just fortify you and be able to give you a level that are a level of backup that you wouldn't have up that another competitor that doesn't self distribute doesn't have and doesn't self distribute other brands Right. It, it's definitely an advantage. You know, you go in and you're selling a portfolio rather than just your own brand. Um, and if you're lucky enough, you know, we were the first mover in San Diego. We created the industry back in 1989. So we had to start our own self-distribution. And once you get over the cost hurdles in distribution, when you add other people's brands onto your trucks, it's just accretive to your business. And so for us, you know, in the last couple of years, we have a very small focus distribution. Uh, sort of concept where we're taking some local brands along with us and we're taking them to market. Uh, but like Dominic said, we're also taking uh, alternative beverages as well. We're taking cider, we're taking coffee, um, and uh, it's working really well. 
And as the California uh, you know, scene of breweries has exploded, we have more than 1,000 breweries here in California. At the same time, the number of distributors has shrunk significantly. So there are fewer and fewer uh, points of access to market for craft brewers here in California. And so for those of us who actually already have a profitable you know, way of, of taking them to market, um, we're in a very good position, and I believe we're both building a lot of value in our distribution businesses. Absolutely. Yeah. Dominique, uh, Stone explored a sim this similar roll-up strategy with Truecraft. Um, that never really got off the ground. Uh, do you believe that that's where this business is headed? And do you think that there was sort of a missed opportunity for Stone there? Um, you know, Truecraft was a great idea and an idea that kind of formed and reformed several times as we tried to perfect that idea in the marketplace. Ultimately, I think um, I do, on the one hand, feel like uh, consolidation is an inevitability in this business for a certain scale brewers. And I think, um, you know, there may be one or two more emerging platforms of a million barrels or more uh, kind of thing in craft beer over time. I, I really do believe that that's, that's going to happen. Uh, on the one hand, um, you know, uh, the thing about craft beer that I find kind of interesting is that most breweries have sort of iconic founders that are really uh, mavericks, that go against the grain and really think independently. And then you're kind of saying at the same time, well, now those mavericks all have to come together and work together. That's not as, not as easy as it sounds. So while the kind of the preeminent logic of uh, how economically it makes sense to be larger and how we shouldn't we all work together when it comes down to the execution, whether that's at the highest level from a founder compatibility standpoint and brand multi-brand ownership versus single brand ownership standpoint, or how it even manifests itself in the distributor alignment. I mean, it really starts to get complicated. So while I do believe in the idea, I think there are a lot of short strokes that um, are tough to figure out. I'm glad you mentioned the founder piece because that's something I'm definitely curious about is taking over for a maverick, you know, one of the founders of a craft brewer, you know, uh, Greg Cook, um, coming into that role, taking over for him is, would not seem to be an easy job to have and to also gain sort of the trust of the employees that, you know, this guy who's coming from outside the industry is coming in. Um, how do you do that? You know, what, what, what steps do you take to sort of, you know, maintain the culture of stone? I, it's, in, you know, it's a big old chemistry experiment and I don't presume to have all the answers, but I will tell you that every, you know, every interpersonal relationship at an executive level or across all the employees of a company is different. And Greg is certainly an individual, and so is Steve, right? We have co-founders at Stone, Steve Wagner and Greg Cook, and they really offset each other in a lot of ways. And that's what I think underpinned a lot of the success of the company. We've recognized since I joined how though some of their role needs to continue and other parts that we can turn the volume down on. And so the simple way to think about it, we think about it, is Greg is really that external face for the brand. And, you know, I have a lot of, you know, I need to be humble as a CEO. I'm not looking to make my name in craft beer as some persona that will compel 200 people to show up at a tap takeover. That's not my job. That's Greg Cook's job. And then in the case of Steve, Steve faces internally and really nurtures the culture of the company, which we've spent a lot of time articulating on paper what would before was sort of a verbal tradition. And so those, those guys have kind of leaned into those aspects and allowed me to come in and help operate the company. And then on top of that, it's been a careful... Um, evolution of bringing in new talent mixed with existing talent, and that is, you know, the never-ending chemistry experiment of, of companies like ours. With strong cultures, you have to do that carefully because you don't want the culture to leave the building with that, with that change. Chris, how do you look at it? Because I, I guess the question I have for you is, have we moved beyond a, a founder story yet in craft? Well, I believe, you know, I think of the Walt Disney example. You know, people go to Disneyland and Disney World and Disney properties and they watch Disney Plus and Walt's been dead for a long time. <laughs> and what the great thing Walt did was he built a culture and he fed the culture and he made it so strong that everyone coming in afterwards had to embrace the culture or they were really thrown out. And so from the 
day one, we didn't name this Chris Kramer Brewing Company or Matt Ratner Brewing Company. This was all about Carl Strauss, even though he was a septuagenarian when we started the company. He's been dead since 2006. Um, but our belief is that you know if you build a strong enough culture and you get your team members to really embrace it and love what they're doing, um, then it can go on and on. The founder isn't really the person, it's the culture. And you have to feed it, you have to invest in it, you have to reinforce the values at every uh, team meeting. And at the end of the day, um, you know, look at your glass door ratings and see how, you know, you're doing. How does the, you know, how, how do your team members think about you? And, you know, I'm really proud, you know, I think we're rated 4.3 on glass door. Our turnover is less than half industry average. Um, you know, the, it's 86% uh, of our team members would recommend working at Carl Strauss to a friend. And, uh, and if you ask any of them, they can tell you what our purpose is, what our values are, um, and they really mean it. And uh, that's how you get 800 team members to continuously move a, a company forward over time. And so I'm less concerned about transition um, because when you have that sort of culture, great people want to come and join the movement. And uh, we've been very blessed in lots of ways. I'll also say the last five years, we've had three of our senior leaders get hired away by other companies, they were vice presidents, get hired away to be the CEOs of other companies. And to uh, one of them was a publicly traded company. And that's like the highest form of flattery, that you're developing people, you're you know attracting great people, and we've had amazing people come in to replace them, and they're taking us to the next level. So culture, Culture trumps strategy every day. And we talked a little bit about uh, succession planning. How do you view succession planning? What, is there a next generation Kramer going to take over, or is it? The <laughs> well, my son uh, Edward is the only one of my children who's expressed any interest. Uh, he's 19. Um, but honestly, uh, you know, our company has investors, friends, and family members, and this isn't about a, a family transition. Uh, you know, nor is it from Matt to his unborn children. You know, what it is really. Uh, about is making sure whoever is going to be leading the company in the future is absolutely the most qualified uh, person. Uh, Matt and I aren't done yet. You know, we're still relatively young, you know, in the uh, scheme of things and working. I, I had the example in my family. My dad worked with Saul Price, uh, who started the Price Club, which spawned the entire warehouse revolution. Um, and he didn't start the Price Club until he was 60. So I've got another couple of years before I get to start the next revolution, you know, of whatever it's going to be. So I think you just get, you, you just at this point in your life, you're getting good. You know stuff that you never knew before. You've made a lot of mistakes that other people haven't made or you've seen other people make them and you can apply it to being better in the future. Just a reminder, uh, we got about 10 minutes left. Uh, if you guys have questions, send them in. I'll ask them for you. Uh, Dominic, you've had to make some hard decisions at Stone this year. Earlier in the year, you guys... Um, sold off Berlin to uh, BrewDog. Yeah. When that is such a big thing that one of the founders has pushed, you know, and has been a dream of the founder, how difficult of a decision is it to have to, you know, hand that off? Pretty difficult. Uh, it's like cutting off an appendage, you know, uh, from, from your body. You know, it's ev eviscerating type uh, experience. I think, um, you know, on the one hand, and how it's generally been perceived, as I've read comments about it, is Greg and Stone are lauded for taking a big chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think everybody believes in the end game. It was arguably a little bit early. We were just thrilled to be able to kind of keep it in the family and uh, pass it on to BrewDog. And really, they've taken up the torch. And uh, we've always collaborated really, really well with those guys. So it was kind of an easy place to go. So it wasn't quite eliminating it from the planet, it was just passing it, the keys on to somebody that can run with it maybe a little bit better than we could. Is there any type of uh, contract brewing arrangement or anything that you guys are able to do through that with them? I think we're just, you know, always seeking ways to collaborate. So, um, and it's not, it's not about, contract brewing is a kind of a small, smaller idea. I mean, I think there's just bigger, more consumer facing things that we want to figure out how to do together. Well, now you've got everybody curious to know what you guys are going to do with BrewDog. Yeah, uh, nothing's planned. I would just say that the aperture is always there because of the long relationship between yeah. the companies. A uh, couple of questions coming in uh, for both of you. What, if any, Beyond Beer products are you exploring? 
I'll let you go first. Oh. <laughs> Well, we have a you know we have a unique unique model similar to Chris's where you know we have our own uh, small systems aligned with our restaurants. Then we have obviously distribution in Southern California, so we can try lots and lots of different things. So we are um, you know just a hive of experimentation. So we've done uh, beer booch, uh, which has been quite quite fun for us. We collaborated with uh, folks over at Boochcraft, who are also one of the brands we distribute. So it's kind of a nice ecosystem there to experiment. Uh, we're certainly um, really keen to see how um, you know cannabis unfolds as far as beverages go in California. So we're keen we're keen about that. Uh, we have a little project going on on the side, which you can hear from the stage here for the first time. We have a, a arrogant bastard whiskey coming out next year, which we're really excited about. Limited uh, release, so we're experimenting in a lot of different directions. I think for us, like I said before, we think about our distributor arm as one where we can really go broad, and we really want to make sure, you know, much like Stone has been developed over the years and arrogant bastard, we want to be clear about who we are and not dilute that too much. So uh, we'll always experiment because. Brewers are expen experimenters, but what we take all the way to the main stage, we're going to be pretty judicious about that. Chris? I think similarly, you know, we've always been open to anything. Um, you know, I, I remember my very first experience in a brewery. I was 10 years old, and I was in Copenhagen, Denmark, and my parents took me to uh, the Carlsberg Brewery, and I had Carlsberg soda. And, you know, so my first brewery product was, you know, an alternative beverage that was not a beer. And I've never thought breweries were necessarily limited to making beer. Um, I happen to be an investor in Sam Adams, and thank God Jim, you know, has done what he's done, you know, the last few years. And, uh, you know, my IRA has benefited from that. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I think we're open to everything. We've got a lot of different experiments, uh, you know, in the works right now. We have some very exciting prospects. Um, but our company, I will always say, has been historically humble in announcing anything. You know, we're the sort of people we don't tell people we've opened a brew pub until after it's already built and open. We, we don't tell people our plans a year or two or five years uh, in advance. It's just not in our DNA. So uh, when we're ready to announce, we will make sure you're the first call. <laughs> As it should be. Uh, Dominic, does uh, Stone have plans to expand its distribution network? So um, we, um, very public, uh, it's open to the public. We, some of you may know that we also have a distributorship in uh, Santa Clara County, which is San Jose uh, in Northern California. So um, that's been a, a startup now for over a year. So that's, uh, that's our expansion plan. Within Southern California, we've painstakingly bought back some pieces within uh, the territory that we uh, sub, use subs for. So now we are 100% coverage, you know, Santa Barbara to the Tijuana border, all the way to the, the border of California on the east. So we, we, we like doing that. Distribution is hard to grow. It takes a lot of capital. And so um, you have to kind of do it very, very carefully. And so we've just tried to really build up what we have and try to do a little bit more in Northern California. Do you guys have any plans for low calorie or ABV products? Low calorie, low ABV products? Yes. Yes. Stone? Yes. Yes? Simple enough. Um, yeah, we have a beer coming out uh, January 1st called Never Ending Haze. It's 4.0. The original beer was 3.0, and uh, so we've been really we've been par experimenting with beers down there. Nice, uh, Chris. Do you even have a name for your product yet? A name? No. No. So uh, I'm I'm curious. In the next five to ten years, you guys run multiple outlets, um, on-premise locations. How many do you anticipate each of you operating in the next five to ten? Years. You know, I first of all, you have to understand it for us, since we only operate in the California environment, just what transition our state is in. Uh, people from outside uh, California may not know that in a four and a half year period, uh, the state of California raised its minimum wage by 50% in one of only seven states in the country that does not recognize tips as wages for the purposes of minimum wage calculation. So in my particular operations last year, our average tipped server made $31.63 an hour. They're going to get an extra dollar an hour January 1st this year, another dollar an hour January 1st the year after, another dollar January 1st after that. 
that takes away the ability for operators to be able to take that money that you're now giving as a windfall to your most highly compensated team members uh, to giving it to the people who do not participate um, in uh, tips. So it's an insane system. It's completely changed the uh, environment for full service dining in the state of California. It's changed the labor environment. Uh, people have had to invest in technology accelerators. People have had to limit the number of uh, team members that they have um, if they're going to succeed. And you know, my dad used to always say, you know, don't whine, get over it, just, you know, adapt and, and, and grow. And, and that's what we're doing. But, you know, we've had to make a significant number of changes to our full service brew pubs in the last couple of years to make sure that they are now well positioned for the new environment. And in the next, you know, couple of years, I fully anticipate there is going to be a huge number of full service restaurants in the state of California that will close. Um, and the state is over restaurants. Um, and uh, with the cost pressures, used to be that food was your number one cost in a, a restaurant. Um, now it's labor, um, and uh, you you know it is just a different environment. And so you have to both change your legacy stores and you have to pivot to the future. So we're developing a new concept that we'll be opening up this next year uh, up in San Marcos where we're taking two acres of land at a time and we're creating the backyard playground uh, for communities where they'll be able to enjoy Carl Strauss beers and Carl Strauss food, but in a more casual, uh, uh, quick service dining environment. And uh, you know the, the test will be in San Marcos. We have another 10 acres we bought uh, out in Santee. We may be doing that concept there. Um, and uh, we think that if that concept proves as we believe um, it will, that uh, we could potentially have many, many of those throughout the state of California. Is, how's Dom, how's uh, Stone uh, adjusting uh, to this minimum wage? Yeah, I think um, like we've seen on the brewery side and like we will continue to see on the brewery side, we'll also see it in the restaurant side is look, these periods of challenge create opportunities for the good operators and uh, it kind of clears away some of the poorer operators. So if you're a good operator in your restaurant, you will be fine. If you have a good position in the marketplace, I love what Chris described as far as you know, creating a backyard environment, continuing, continuing to evolve your experience is, is essential. Uh, if you stand still, you will rot and fade away. So um, you know, doing those types of things we pride ourselves on being a good operator. We operate two of the largest restaurants in San Diego County. Uh, one's been open for 13 years. That, that's a long time for a restaurant, and he has he has similar successes like that. So our first one's open 30 years. Yeah, so there you Coming go. On 31 in February. Yeah, I'm just a baby. So um, basically, you know, the good operators will win in that environment. Um, and the good news is, is we're brewers too, and uh, so a lot of our the the beer that we sell, we're making that that proves to be a good economic equation, transparently, you know, versus somebody that's just a third party operating. And you know, it's a vital source of information. And I think if you're good at operating restaurants, you can actually learn a lot about your product, your beer, and, and then infuse that into your go ongoing strategy as a brewery. And there are significant advantages to scale. There we go. Well, thank you guys. We're out of time. Thank you all for the great questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.